Gary Torbs is one of the most iconic people in the low carbohydrate movement. He wrote in 2007 this fabulous book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which to me is probably the most important medical text written in the last 50 years. The book is so important because it discusses the absence of evidence for the low-fat diet that was introduced in 1977. In his talk, he will be speaking about the second book that he wrote, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. And he presents the evidence that obesity is caused by a high-carbohydrate diet causing abnormally elevated insulin concentrations, which then promote obesity. One caveat before I start, I uh, flew here from California. I got in this morning about four hours ago uh, after 24 hours of flying. So should I break into a sweat or start stammering or pass out on the stage? I just want you to know it's probably a combination of jet lag. It's not necessarily my diet. Um, <laughs> I am assuming that it's humanly possible to do this, and I'm going from there. So um, let's get started. Figure out how to, like if I figure out how to, there we go. Okay, context, as we've been talking about, as Peter talked about today, and these slides are the American numbers. You know, we have an obesity epidemic on our hands. Uh, it's worldwide, and the U.S. obesity rates have increased two and a half fold uh, since the uh, early 1960s. And it goes along with the diabetes epidemic. The diabetes numbers are even more frightening. Uh, if you go back again to the early 1960s and you believe the CDC numbers, the prevalence of diabetes in the US has increased uh, ninefold. If you go back to the 1890s and you take into account all kinds of problems with diagnostic criteria and how they've changed, you could say the prevalence of diabetes in the US has increased uh, 100 to 1,000 fold. Diabetes was a a vanishingly rare condition in the United States in the 19th century. And one of the points about these slides, uh, something that uh, Peter Bond brought up that I find fascinating is, this is a public health disaster. And yet we are absolutely convinced that we understand the cause of obesity and diabetes, the dietary and lifestyle causes of these diseases. And we've been giving roughly the same advice since the 1960s. And if this was HIV AIDS, if this was a graph of, say, lung cancer prevalence, and it just continued to go up and up and up, despite our belief that we understood it, we would have a, a national task force, World Health Organization task force, uh, scientific committees meeting monthly to try and figure out what it is about these disease states, our underlying understanding of the etiology that we don't understand. Because we obviously don't understand something. We could blame it on the public. We can blame it on the food industry. But a graph like this is an illustration of the need for scientific humility. There's something missing in our understanding of this disease. So the role I played as a journalist, and I am a journalist, I'm not an MD, I'm not a PhD, was I got the opportunity to go back with an open mind and a scientific training to see if we had missed something. And I had significant funding to do it. I had, well, I had four years of my life. I spent five, which took care of the significant funding and then some. <laughs> Still apologizing to my wife on that one. And so what I'm going to give you today is a little bit of, uh, I'm going to tell you what I learned in this. And one of the things you can do as a journalist, which you can't do as a scientist, you can interview every major figure in the field. You can, I interviewed... Uh, hundreds of people for this research, virtually everyone who was uh, still alive, even people who had done work back in the 1950s and 60s. Then you can also add to that what the internet age did. It allowed me to find virtually all the primary sources. Uh, back when I started this work, they weren't downloadable or on Google Books. Now many of them are. But I probably have one of the two or three best private collections of obesity texts in the world. I was able to, in fact, recreate the history of the science of obesity from conference proceedings, which libraries would give away, and then you could find a used bookstore somewhere in the world that would sell it to you for $9 and have it delivered within a week. So it gave me a relatively unique opportunity to do this investigation as a journalist that might not have been possible had I actually been working in the field. And also as a journalist, I could come to contrarian viewpoints without worrying about the fact that it might ruin my, uh, my uh, prospects for advancement. So moving on, uh, 
with obesity comes this cluster of chronic diseases. Um, we've talked, Peter talked about some of them, stroke, heart disease, gallbladder, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes and obesity are so closely associated that even as far back as 100 years ago in the literature, the assumption was that there was something about being obese that called cause type 2 diabetes. Neurodegeneration, which call, uh, includes Alzheimer's, asthma, fatty liver disease, which is also now epidemic, cancer. So the conventional thinking on this is something about uh, the state of getting fatter. Uh, maybe the inflammatory molecules released increases your uh, prospect for getting these other chronic diseases and shortens your life. There's another possible causality I want you to keep in mind as I give this talk which is that whatever it is that makes you fat also causes all these diseases, okay? So in that sense, this talk could be called Why We Get Sick. And I give versions of this talk about heart disease and diabetes, but they're open to the, the claim that I'm uh, cherry-picking my data. I prefer to give the talk on obesity because it's simpler. And it doesn't require virtually, I can give the talk without giving virtually any uh, studies at all. So the question we want to ask is, what, what makes us fat? And the conventional wisdom is pretty simple. As WHO puts it, the fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended. And you could find a line like this on virtually or perhaps every single uh, public health website in the world and in you know, uh, multiple different languages. So uh, in the... Scientific literature, you'll see this sentence, obesity is an energy balance disorder. And what they mean by that is if we, if we take in more energy than we expend, we get fatter. Calories in, calories out. We overeat. The biblical term for this problem, this, this theory, would be the gluttony and sloth theory of obesity. And then what you want to do in science, you want to explain the observations, okay? So the observation out there is we have this obesity epidemic. So how do we take this energy balance hypothesis of obesity and explain the epidemic? And it's pretty simple. The idea is um, as a civilization, as a population gets richer, as we increase our prosperity, we have more energy-dense food available. Um, the phrase used by uh, Kelly Brown now, who ran the Rudd Center at Yale University, was a, a toxic obesogenic environment. So this is how Kelly put it. He said, cheeseburgers and french fries, drive-in windows and supersizes, soft drinks and candy, potato chips and cheese curls, once unusual, are as much our background as trees, grass, and clouds. Few children walk or bike to school. There's little phys ed. Computers, video games, and televisions keep children inside and inactive. Parents are reluctant to let children roam free to play. So here's what the hypothesis looks like. Too much food, too little physical activity leads to overeating, energy in greater than energy out, and the result is obesity and the obesity epidemic. So just to get a feel for my audience, I'd like to know how many of you think this is you know, mostly true. OK, don't be shy. OK. Um, about 50%, I'd say, which is good. Uh, the point about this hypothesis, it is a hypothesis. It may seem like it was written on stone and uh, chiseled in commandments and then passed down from the mountaintop. But like anything else in science, we could treat it as a hypothesis. And we could look for counterexamples, OK? Black swans. This is one of the obvious things you would do if this was a scientific investigation. So you might go looking for. Um, examples of populations that had high levels of obesity but didn't have any of this toxic obesogenic environment that we blame it on today. So maybe hardworking poor populations without fast food joints and without computers and video games and where the parents don't keep the kids home uh, from school, where they, the, the, um, you know, they, they, they work hard for a living. And I went through the literature and I was able to find about a dozen of these prior to the 1980s, okay? Uh, we could start with 1928. Uh, this is one of the earliest ones I found, the, the Red on Top Sioux on the South Dakota Crow Creek Reservation. This was a study by two University of Chicago economists. Um, in 1928, 1927, the U.S. government did a study of the conditions on the Native American reservations, and they concluded that the poverty was almost unimaginable by the levels of 1927. So you could imagine how unimaginable it would be to us today. Uh, the 
people on this reservation lived four to eight uh, per room. They had no plumbing, no uh, running water. They had no toilets. They had their food delivered, uh, mostly came from government rations once a month. And yet 40% of the women, 10% of the men, and 25% of the children on this reservation were obese, distinctly fat as they were described. And a significant uh, number of the population was also extremely thin. In fact, uh, deficiency diseases were obvious on this population. Malnourishment was rife. And this combination of obesity in coincidence with malnutrition is known today as the dual or double burden of obesity and malnutrition. And it's common throughout the world. And it's a, an observation we're going to return to frequently on this list. Um, if you go down to the middle there, 1961-63, Trinidad. Trinidad was having a malnutrition crisis. The U.S. government sends a team of nutritionists down to uh, help out. And they come back reporting that a third of the women over 25 are obese, and that obesity is a potentially serious medical problem in women. The next year, a nutritionist from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is sent down to Trinidad to quantify and qualify the diets being consumed. And she reports that the per capita daily diet is less than 2,000 calories, a 21% fat, a very low fat diet. And this was fewer calories at the time than was actually recommended by the Food and Agriculture Organization as necessary for a healthy diet. If we go to the next page, you go to the top, uh, 64, 65, Bantu pensioners here in South Africa. This is the poorest of a disenfranchised black population in the, in the midst of the apartheid era, and yet the mean weight of women over 60 was 165 pounds, and 30% of them were severely overweight. Uh, going down towards the bottom, 1974, Chilean factory workers. Most are engaged in heavy labor. So this is a population. They're not going, they don't have health club memberships. They're not training for marathons. They're not power walking 45 minutes a day or watching Jane Fonda do her exercise routines on TV. But we could be pretty confident that this is a very physically active population. And yet 30% are obese and 10% are undernourished. There's that dual burden again. And nearly 50% of the women over 54 are obese. And then the last study that I'm going to mention uh, in this group, in 1981, Mexican-Americans in Starr County, Texas. Starr County, Texas is on the border of tech, the state of Texas and Mexico. It's a poor Hispanic population. Most of the inhabitants is the uh, Researchers reported are employed in agricultural labor and or work in the oil fields. So this is a hard-working, poor population, and yet 50% of the women in their 50s are obese, 40% of the men in their 40s. And there was one restaurant in Starr County, Texas in 1981, a Mexican restaurant. So there's no McDonald's, there's no Burger Kings, there's no fast food joints of any kind, and yet there's levels of obesity almost as high as we have in the United States today. And... <clears throat> The question is, there's obviously something toxic about these environments because that level of obesity is unnatural, but it's hard to blame it on the, the things we blame obesity on today. They had no iPads, no television sets. Um, the kids were out running as free as they wanted to, and yet they're growing up to be obese adults. And then here's a modern example. This is a study that was published a couple years ago. It's a double burden of obesity and malnutrition in a protracted emergency setting. It's Western Saharan uh, emigres in living in refugee camps in the Sahara Desert. Um, as you can see, 28% of the households had this double burden of obesity and malnutrition. So that's obese and overweight women, aunts or mothers, living with uh, undernourished, malnourished, stunted children in the same household. So we can ask the question, why were these populations fat? Because if we can figure out why they were fat we we'll probably have a pretty good idea why our populations are so fat. This is a concept in science known as Occam's razor. It's a basically don't complicate hypothesis beyond necessity. So we're going to assume going in that whatever made these people fat also makes us fat. Here's how this question was asked in 1973 by Ralph Richards. Richards was a British-trained diabetes specialist who in the 1960s went to Kingston, Jamaica and opened a diabetes clinic in Kingston at the University of the West Indies. In 1973, he reports at a conference that two-thirds of the adult women in Kingston are obese. And he says, it's difficult to explain the high frequency of obesity seen in a relatively impecunious society that's a poor society. 
such as exists in the West Indies when compared to the standard of living enjoyed in the more developed countries. So he's asking the same question we're asking, or I'm asking, is you expect rich countries to be fat. They're the ones who have too much food available. They're the ones where they don't have to do manual labor. But here you have this high level of obesity in this poor society. It says malnutrition and subnutrition are common disorders in the first two years of life. Subnutrition continues in early childhood to the early teens. By subnutrition, he means that children are not getting enough calories, enough food. Obesity begins to manifest itself in the female population from the 25th year of life and reaches enormous proportions from 30 onwards. And the interesting thing about this, back in the early 1970s, obesity was still considered in the literature a type of malnutrition. So if you use the word malnutrition, you're making the assumption that there's something wrong with the food supply, but you don't know what it is. Since that time, we turned obesity into this concept of overnutrition caused by overeating, and we, we in fact, put a, 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 a belief system on top of our observation. What we want to find out is, is that belief system valid? So here's how this question was discussed, the same question circa 2005. It's by Benjamin Caballero from Johns Hopkins University. He runs a laboratory for human engineering there. Um, this was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a very good journal on this dual burden that we talked about. And he says, a few years ago, I was visiting a primary care clinic in the slums of Sao Paulo, Brazil. The waiting room was full of mothers with thin, stunted young children exhibiting the typical signs of chronic undernutrition. Their appearance, their appearance wouldn't surprise us. What might come as a surprise, he said, is that many of the mothers holding those undernourished infants were themselves overweight. And then he says, the coexistence of underweight and overweight poses a challenge to public health programs since the aims of programs to reduce undernutrition, which is make more food available, right, are obviously in conflict with those for obesity prevention just make less food available. I put this phrase poses a challenge to public health programs in bold italics because this coexistence of underweight and overweight doesn't actually pose a challenge to your uh, public health programs. It poses a challenge to your belief systems. If you believe that these women got obese because they took in superfluous calories that their bodies didn't need to burn, you have to ask the question why they didn't give those superfluous calories to their starving infants. Okay? I mean, if they're going out at night, sneaking out at night to eat Snickers bars and their kids are starving, we have to wonder that there may be something wrong with maternal behavior in these women. So we have a paradigm of maternal behavior that says women will starve so that their children will live. And we have a paradigm of obesity that says that these women are eating superfluous calories that they could give to their kids. Let me ask a question. How many of you are mothers out here? How many of you would overeat while your children are starving? Okay, you see the problem we've got. We have to throw out one of these two paradigms. I might point out, by the way, that I grew up in the physics community, as Tim pointed out. My first two books were on physics. And physics, for instance, they've just spent $10 billion building this particle accelerator outside of Geneva so they could try and generate anomalous data. That's an observation that their theories can't explain. Because if you have an observation that your theory can't explain, you can expand your theory. You can find out what's wrong with it, and you can make it better. And in the field of nutrition and chronic disease, you have observations like this, this paradox of malnutrition and obesity in the same populations where you've got these two, two paradigms that are completely at odds with each other. And you have to be able to explain it if you're going to be able to explain obesity. And this is a kind of observation that if the nutrition and obesity research community were doing their job right, I think would have been front and foremost. It wouldn't be considered a paradox. It would be considered a reason to rewrite the hypothesis. So there are other reasons to question this energy balance hypothesis, and we can go through them. The first is that if we get fat because we eat too much, then eating less should work. Okay, there are explanations for why it does, and we have these thrifty genes and stuff like this. But if you think about it, you don't wake up one morning and find yourself obese. You get fat a little bit at a time. You start off 5% overweight, 5 pounds overweight, 10 pounds overweight, 15 pounds. Any point along the way when you have to expand your belt loop one place, you can stop and decide, I'm getting fatter. I should eat less. 
And yet it doesn't seem to work. And in clinical trials, when people look at trials of calorie-restricted diets, as the Cochrane Collaboration said in 2002, the results are so small as to be clinically insignificant. In fact, Hilda Brook pointed this out, that it shouldn't come as a surprise back in the 1950s. Hilda Brook was a German emigre who came to the U.S. in 1933 and actually started the first pediatric obesity clinic in the U.S. at Columbia University, and she did it because she was walking around in New York in 1934 and couldn't believe the number of obese children she saw on the streets and the subways of New York, despite 1934 being the very depth of the Depression. Okay, a period when four out of ten people were out of work. It was a period of uh, bread, uh, bread lines and soup kitchens, or soup lines and bread kitchens. People were poor, exceedingly poor, and yet there were all these obese kids. So Hilda Brooks starts an obesity clinic. She becomes the world's leading authority on obesity and, uh, and eating beho- uh, disorders. In 1957, she points this out. She says, look, more than in any other illness, a physician treating the obese patient is called upon only to do a special trick to make the patient do something, stop eating after it has already been proved that he cannot do it. Okay, we all know as we're getting fatter, we're supposed to eat less. That's obvious. That's been, you know, a, a, an assumption for hundreds of years. If we end up fat anyway, as a third of the American public, for instance, does, it's a pretty good sign that eating less doesn't work, and the clinical trials support that. The flip side of this is, unfortunately, that exercising more doesn't work. And by exercising more, I mean increasing your energy expenditure. So this is an energy balance issue. We have to take in more calories than we expend. The idea is if we just up our expenditure, we'll be able to lose weight. And I could quote meta-analyses that show how infinitesimal the effect of that is in clinical trials, but I find this more compelling. In 2007, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine published Joint Physical Activity Guidelines. And this was written by a group of people who believe, as I do, that physical activity is an inherent part of a healthy lifestyle. You would expect them to spin the evidence to make physical activity as appealing as human or as beneficial as, as possible. And yet this is what they say about this idea that increasing expenditure should lead to a decrease in weight. They say it's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures, which is logically the equivalent of saying it's reasonable to assume that if I'm a couch potato, I'll be less likely to gain weight over time if I become a marathon runner than if I remain a couch potato. And then they say so far data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. Now, the point is this hypothesis is about 100 to 150 years old, depending on how you want to date it. And if the best you could say about this kind of hypothesis, a century-old hypothesis after a century of testing and thinking about it and probing and pushing and randomized controlled trials, is that the data supported are not particularly compelling, you should seriously consider the possibility that the hypothesis is wrong. Now, let me give you another way to think about this, okay? Imagine that for dinner tonight, we were going to hold a feast. I got the 10 best chefs in all of Africa to come to Tim Noakes' house at Tim's expense (laughs) and cook a feast the likes of which you can't imagine, okay? There's going to be course after course after course of the best food imaginable. I'm repeating that word. That's the lack of sleep. And you get an invitation when you go and come to the lecture. The invitation says, tonight you're coming to this feast. You're never going to taste food like this again in your life. I want you to come hungry, bring your appetites. What do you think you might do today to assure that when you got to Tim's house tonight, you were as hungry as humanly possible? I'm willing to take suggestions from the audience. Yeah, eat less. Maybe you'd skip uh, lunch or eat less for lunch. You'd certainly skip your snacks. You know, breakfast would be smaller. And you might even exercise more, right? You might work out. Remember the concept of building up an appetite? So you might, if you were going to work out, you might double it. If you weren't going to work out, you might decide to go to the gym anyway. And you might even say, look, Tim only lives seven miles from here. I'm going to walk. Because if I walk, I'm going to build up an appetite, right? And then you could just ask the question, why is it the two things that we tell obese people to do to lose weight, eat less and exercise more, the exact two things that any normal human being would do if they wanted to assure that they were hungry? Okay, and right there you begin to think maybe there's something wrong with our hypothesis. <laughs> 
Okay, here's another problem, the energy balance challenge. The Centers for Disease Control in the United States tells us that weight management is all about balance, balancing the number of calories you consume with the number of calories your body uses or burns off. Okay, what I'm about to give you is a calculation that I first saw in a 1937 metabolism textbook written by the leading authority on nutrition and metabolism in the United States of that era, a fellow named Eugene Dubois. And I'm going to do this calculation for the very same reason Dubois did it. A typical adult's food intake is about 2,700 kilocalories a day. That's average men and women. That's about a million calories a year. 10 million calories in a decade. It's about 10 to 12 tons of food. Now, you want to ask this question. We have to, in order to maintain a healthy weight, we have to balance calories in, calories out. So I don't want to gain two pounds a year. That's the maximum I'm going to gain. Because if I gain two pounds a year, that's 20 pounds a decade. It's 40 pounds in 20 years, I will go from being lean in my 20s to obese in my 40s, as many of us do. I don't want that to happen. So how closely do I have to match calories in, calories out? How closely do I have to balance the two? Here's the question, and here's the answer. 21 calories a day. If I put 21 calories a day in my fat tissue that I do not burn, I will gain 20 pounds in a decade, 40 pounds in 20 years. Here's the calculation. It's exceedingly simple mathematics, about second grade math. 20 calories a day times 365 days a year times 10 years and a decade divided by 3,500 calories per pound of fat which is a reasonable estimate, is about 21 pounds in a decade. If I don't want to gain 10 pounds in a decade, I got to balance to 10 calories a day, okay? That's 0.8% uh, accuracy for 20 calories, 0.4% accuracy for 10 calories. The point is no human being can do that. No animal can do it, okay? No machine can do it. Um, I'm a big guy, okay? I probably eat 3,000 calories a day. Let's say that's 20 calories per bite of food. That's 150 bites of food, swallows of food a day. If I burn off 149 of them and the 150th ends up in my fat tissue, I will end up obese. That's what this calculation tells you. This is what Dubois said. He said, there's no stranger phenomenon than the maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. Okay, even if we had the Guinness World's record holder of calorie counting who could guess the amount of calories they eat in different types of food to 20 calories a day, they have no idea how much they're expending. Okay, there has to be a way to maintain a constant body weight that has nothing to do with this calories in, calories out. That's what this number tells you. And the reason you never see this number in textbooks and when the people tell you to count calories is because as soon as you see that number, you have to start thinking there's something wrong here with this theory. Okay, here's another problem. Now I'm about to show you, I have to apologize, I'm about to show you photos of naked human beings, okay? There are, these are all from pre-World War II textbooks, and I am now channeling what the pre-World War II German and Austrian clinicians thought about obesity. So I'm going to be using an argument that they used. In fact, one of the things I learned doing my research, there are quite a few things. One is that um, all major important medical science in these fields were done in Germany, Austria, pre-World War II. The apex of medical science could have been Germany and Austria in the 1930s, as it was in physics. What's interesting in physics, um, when I was writing about physics, my second book, I lived in Geneva, the European, first book, I lived in Geneva, the European scientists used to say the best thing that ever happened to US science was the Second World War because Germany and Hitler chased all these brilliant American physicists, brilliant European physicists over to the US and we embraced them because we had atomic bombs to build and the Cold War to fight. They also chased the medical scientists out of Europe, but we didn't embrace them. Nobody did. We wanted nothing to do with these people because they didn't help us build bombs. In fact, one of the reasons um, <clears throat> some of the greatest medical minds of that generation, you wouldn't recognize their names, or I bet a lot of you would recognize the names of the physicists from that period, people like Planck. How many of you know the name Planck, or Heisenberg, or Schrodinger? Okay, how about von Neumann, uh, Falta, Bauer, 
The latter are the great medical names of that period, and the former are the physicists. And what happened with this medical science is it simply evaporated with the war, and I documented that in my book. But it's that science I'm going to start giving you now with these photos. These Europeans believed it was important to have photos of obese human beings in their medical textbooks instead of obese rats, which is what you see today, because they thought that you could learn a lot from how people get fat and when they get fat and where they could get fat, and that could tell you something about the fattening process. Today we talk about whether or not you have a BMI under or over 30, but that doesn't tell you much, as we'll see. So the first thing, we have a a uh, pair of identical twins. We know obesity has a huge genetic component that was first shown, quantified by Julius Bauer in the 1930s, a name I'll come back to. Um, so on the left is a lean pair of identical twins, and on the right is an obese pair, and we could argue that our calories in, calories out energy balance theory might explain why one pair are obese and the other aren't. The obese twins, they ate too much, and the lean twins practice perfect energy balance. But why do these women have the same bodies, okay? Body type, we know in identical twins, they don't just have the same faces, they have the same body. So something is making the fat go to the same place on these women, regardless of how much they've accumulated, lean and obese. And it's hard to imagine that that has anything to do with how much they ate or exercised. So there must be genes that determine where fat goes. Another way to think of this is to think in terms of animal husbandry, which was another example used by the pre-World War II Europeans. So on the left, you've got a Jersey cow. It's a dairy cow. You could see the swollen udder. It's lean. You could actually see the ribs. And on the right is an Aberdeen Angus. It's a beef cow. Uh, it's a stocky, beefy animal. And you could see the intramuscular fat and the inset and the meat. And you can ask the question, we know this is genetic, right? Because these are different breeds of cattle. So the question is, what is it that makes a jersey so lean? And why is the Aberdeen Angus so beefy? Pardon the expression. What are the genes doing? Are they determining how much these animals eat and exercise? So do the genes determine, for instance, how many calories per bite of grass the jersey takes when it bites, or how many hours per day it eats compared to the, maybe it only grazes for 10 hours and the Aberdeen Angus grazes for 12, and that's why it's beefier? Maybe the Jersey wants to go for a run at night when it gets dark, and the Aberdeen Angus is genetically programmed to go watch TV. You guys are laughing. I actually once went to a childhood obesity conference where a leading authority on obesity from the University of Pennsylvania said that there was a gene that predisposed people to eat at fast food restaurants. And not a single person in the esteemed audience said, are you out of your mind? Anyway, so what's going on here? What could be going on? That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you think of it in terms of animals. Let's assume, um, you know, that's sort of getting clinical here. Well, whoa, get back here. What we want from the, uh, this animal is a, uh, an animal that takes in fuel here and converts it to milk. Okay, milk is actually, uh, creating milk is a very energy expensive proposition. So we want it, we don't want the fuel cluttering up its, you know, uh, accumulating as beef and fat, as protein and fat in its body. We want it all being used by the milk. And actually, maybe the udders needing so much fuel just kind of draw all the fuel to them so there isn't a lot left to accumulate. In the Aberdeen Angus, we want this. We want the fuel to allocate or to partition to protein and fat because we want a beefy animal. So maybe these genes are fuel allocation or fuel partitioning genes. They're not about how much fuel the animal takes in or how much it expends, but where it uses that fuel, where the fuel goes. That's one way we might think about this that can ex begin to explain these two animals at least. Now, if we look at sexual variations, you know, men get fat above the waist, women get fat below the waist. Both these people would have taken in more calories than they expended, so their calories in would have been greater than calories out. But we can ask the question, why is it that the, the man got fat in his gut and the woman got fat below the waist? What do the calories have to do with it? And by getting fat in above the waist, what they call apple-shaped obesity, the man doubled his risk of obesity, where the woman did not. They could weigh the same amount, but one got fat in one place, one got fat somewhere else. What do the calories have to do with it? What, are, what does our energy balance hypothesis say at all about this problem? You know, I keep thinking I would like a hypothesis of obesity that would help me understand why people get fat in different places.
you think about puberty, uh, this is another example from the pre-World War II era, although the diagram obviously isn't. Men and women enter puberty with roughly the same amount of body fat. Um, the boys go through puberty, they get bigger, they lose fat and gain muscle. The girls gain fat and they gain fat in very specific places. You could argue um, evolution might like those places because they drive the boys crazy. By the time they get out of puberty, the girls have 50% more fat on their bodies than the boys. Both of them got bigger. Both of them took in more calories than they expended, and yet one lost fat and gained muscle, and the girls gained fat and gained it in very specific places. What do those calories have to do with it? Obviously, our energy balance hypothesis says nothing about why these people got fat and where they got fat. And we know it's a hormonal issue. In this case, growth hormone was driving their growth. Sex hormones determine the uh, fat muscle uh, growth issues and where the fat went on the women. But if this was a hormonal pr issue, why is it that we consider obesity an energy balance issue and hormones an excuse for why fat people don't want to exercise and eat in moderation? Okay, lipodystrophies. This is the last uh, slides I'm going to show you, last photos. By the time I got to this in my book, my editor was asking me to rein it in. He said it was beginning to look like a freak show. Um, <laughs> It's a very rare lipodystrophy known as progressive lipodystrophy. By the 1950s, there are about 200 of these on record. In these cases, the women, mostly women, 80% women, they start by losing subcutaneous fat in their foreheads, and it heads downward. And actually, I got an email about a month ago from a woman who said she was reading my book, Why We Got Fat, and she got to this picture, and she started to cry because this had happened to her in her teenage years and she never understood it, and no doctor had ever diagnosed it, and it was extremely clear that she had progressive lipodystrophy. So often this loss of fat will stop around the waist, and then you might get lower body obesity developing later. Um, in these cases, it's fascinating. They have virtually no subcutaneous fat above the waist. Above the waist, they look like the front place finishers in a marathon. Below the waist, they can be obese. And what these German Austrians said is they said, look, are we going to blame the top half on undereating and the bottom half on overeating? And this is a thought experiment, but if we can't blame localized obesity on overeating, how can we blame full body obesity on overeating? And what right do we have to do that? And if this woman had five to ten pounds more fat on her upper body than she does, it would be exceedingly clear. Well, excuse me, it would no longer be clear that she has a lipodystrophy. And when she went into the doctor's office, the doctor would ask her to, you know, eat less and exercise more. And she had a BMI of 34 as it was. So again, something's wrong with this theory. And it is, again, it's a hypothesis, and it's worth understanding the history of this. One of the things I noticed doing my research, again, I grew up in the physics community. In physics, you learn your science with the history attached. That's why these names like uh, Planck and Schrodinger or Heisenberg are familiar to people, because as you're taught physics, you're taught not just what you should believe, but why you should believe it, and who did the work, and what experiments tested it, and what ex those experiments showed. So you have have a firm understanding of the basis of your knowledge. But in medicine, uh, people have so much to learn so quickly. You have to come out of medical school with so many factoids crammed into your head that your best teachers will say, well, 50% of what I teach you is going to be wrong. We don't know what 50% it is. But they won't teach you why you believe what you believe or what the history is. And I was fascinated with the history. And this theory, this hypothesis does have a history. So it's actually a German-American hypothesis. It starts with Carl von Norden in the 1900s, a leading German diabetes specialist. And von Norden, um, well, let me uh, actually go back even further. This is uh, even more fascinating. So in the, the modern nutrition dates to the late 1860s with the invention of hum, hum, human-sized machines capable of measuring the energy expenditure of humans or adults, called calorimeters. And from the 1870s onward to the 1920s, nutrition science was dominated by the science of calorimetry. So the researchers involved measured how much energy was in food, they measured how much energy people expended, and they thought in terms of energy into bodies and energy out of bodies, and they came out naturally with a theory a way of thinking about nutrition in terms of energy balance. And one of the things you learn in science is the equipment you have available determines the questions you could ask and the questions you ask and determine the answers you could give. So by 1910, 1920, we had a theory of obesity, a theory of energy balance, because that's what the science at the time was measuring. 
Um, in 1900s, von Neumann declared caloric imbalance as a cause of obesity based on this idea of energy in and energy out. He said the ingestion of a quantity of food greater than that required by the body leads to an accumulation of fat and to obesity should it go on. And then Lewis Newberg comes along. Newberg was a, a researcher at the University of Michigan, and his revelation was that all obese people are alike in one fundamental respect. They literally overeat, and as we'll discuss shortly, they have to overeat. And therefore, obesity is caused either by a perverted appetite, which is eating too much, or lessened outflow of energy, insufficient expenditure. So what this did is it turned obesity into this idea of full, sort of full body energy balance. You measure how much energy goes in, you measure how much energy goes out and the differences causes you to get fat. And when asked a simple question, why don't obese people compensate by eating less or exercising more? I mean, after all, these are under conscious control. Newberg said because they suffer from various human weaknesses, such as overindulgence and ignorance. And as you'll notice from Newberg's picture, he probably didn't consider himself to be a kind of person who suffered from those things. <laughs> Too many thin people in the science of obesity. Okay, so where does the problem lie? Ignorance, self-indulgence, it's in the head. You've got a disorder of excess fat accumulation. The problem is ignorance, self-indulgence, gluttony, and sloth. Here's the modern version of that. The effect is too much fat, but the causes are all in the brain here where the problem lies. Okay, so why energy balance? Why do we ever believe this? And the answer is physics. Again, this was a period when we were studying energy balance, energy in, energy out, and we were doing it under what was then a relatively new revelation, the laws of thermodynamics. And the first law is the one that's meaningful. It's the only easy one to understand, the law of energy conservation. Um, and it's pretty simple. Energy is conserved, so if uh, energy in a system gets larger, it means more energy has to uh, enter the system than left leaves it, and the way it's described, um, whoop, let me get back. The, um, we, we uh, in the diet field, this is called the energy balance equation, and the idea is a change in fat mass is equal to energy consumed minus energy expended. It makes a lot of sense. Basically, what's it saying, if, you know, if I'm, increase my intake and I don't decrease my expenditure, then the amount of fat I'm storing has to go up. And if I uh, decrease my expenditure, if I break my ankle and I can't go for a daily run and I continue to eat as much as any ever, then the amount of fat I store also has to go up. And so the idea is therefore um, obesity or an increase in fat storage is caused by an increase in intake or a, a decrease in expenditure, an imbalance between them. And the problem with this way of thinking is that there's no arrow of causality here. This is what I call the kind of the original sin in obesity research, and it still boggles my mind that this ever happened. Um, if you think about it, what this equation says is that if a system gets more massive, more energy has to enter than leave. It doesn't tell you anything about why. It doesn't say the system got more massive because more energy entered than left. And if you think about various metaphors to explain this, I like the one about, for instance, banking. You know, if instead of lecturing about obesity, we were lecturing on, I was lecturing on wealth management today, and you want to know why did people get rich? Like, how did Bill Gates get so rich? And I said, well, money is conserved, right? So he obviously took in more money than he spent. Have I told you anything you don't know, right? Because it's obvious if he got rich, he took in more money than he spent. And you say, Gary, it's obvious. And I say, but look, if he takes in more money than he spends and he keeps it up long enough, he'll get rich, right? And it's the exact same logic that we're using for obesity. If we were talking about global climate change, which is also a serious, you know, uh, uh, the, among the most serious problems facing humanity, um, and you said, Gary, why is the atmosphere heating up? And I said, because it's taking in more energy than it expends, I'd be laughed out of the audience. But in obesity, you can actually say people get fatter because they take in more energy than they expend, and you get taken seriously. The reality is if people take in, if somebody gets fatter, they have to take in more energy than they expend. Just as if somebody gets richer, they have to take in more money than they spent. But neither one of those says anything about why those things happened. And what we did is we took a, an equation that says nothing about causality and we inflicted a causality on it and then took it seriously ever after. So to this day, if somebody argues that obesity is not an energy balance disorder and the laws of thermodynamics have nothing to do with it, you're accused of not understanding the laws of thermodynamics or saying they somehow don't hold for humans. The point here, 
is that this theory is virtually, this is what I, uh, it's, it's nonsensical to say obesity is caused by overeating. Because if someone got fat, they had to have taken in more calories than they expend. The question is why? So there was an alternative hypothesis I suggested. It was a German-Austrian hypothesis. And we could start off with the basic principle. So you start off with this simple idea that obesity is a disorder of excess fat accumulation, not a disorder of energy balance, not a disorder of overeating, not a disorder of sedentary behavior or of toxic environments, but it's a disorder of excess fat accumulation. It's like saying getting fat is a disorder of having, or having too much fat is a disorder of having too much fat which seems ridiculously simple and tautological, but if you asked it like that and phrased it like that, the first question you might ask if you were a medical profession is, I wonder what regulates fat accumulation. If you define the order as a disorder of energy balance of intake and expenditure, what you wonder about is what regulates intake and expenditure. As the pharmaceutical industry does today, all their research is aimed at trying to suppress appetite and increase expenditure. But the question is, what regulates fat metabolism? What regulates fat accumulation? That's a question we've learned not to ask for reasons I'll go into briefly. In this hypothesis, overeating inactivity or compensatory effects are not causes. And we don't get fat because we overeat. We overeat because our fat tissue is accumulating excess fat. And I'll explain these shortly. So we change the direction of causality when we think about it like this. In the conventional wisdom, we assume that intake and expenditure drive changes in fat mass. In this alternative hypothesis, you assume that changes in fat mass actually drive intake and expenditure, that fat mass is exceedingly well regulated as everything in the human body is. And if you dysregulate it so that it's accumulating excess fat or even mobilizing and oxidizing excess fat, that will have compensatory effects on how much you want to eat and exercise. So here's an analogy. This, again, is a pre-World War II analogy, although the photo happens to be an exceedingly cute kid who now lives in Oakland, California. The photo on the left, he's a year old, he weighs 20 pounds. The photo on the right, he's four years old, he weighs 45 pounds. This kid has gotten bigger, he's gotten more massive, he's taken in more energy than he expended. You could say he's overeaten. But that's not why he grew. He didn't grow because he took in more energy than he expended. He took in more energy than he expended because he grew. And in fact, all of us who have children know that when your kids are going through growth spurts, they tend to get hungrier. We have all these phrases about what happens when they hit puberty. They're eating us out of house and home. They're lying around the house all day. But that's not why they're growing and going through puberty. The reason they're eating us out of house and home is because they're growing and going through puberty. Growth is the cause. Changes in intake and expenditure are the effect. If you think of a pathological analogy like cancer, you can see a tumor cell growing in this um, these slides, it's getting bigger and bigger. That tumor is taking in more energy than it expends, but that is not why it's growing. It's actually even upregulating enzymes and, and other uh, receptors to take in as much energy as possible. But it's doing that because it's being driven to unfettered growth, and it's being driven to unfettered growth because oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are broken. Growth is the cause. This energy imbalance is the effect. Here's a pathological version of this, that, taking that to the most extreme case. Imagine having a tumor that weighs 112 pounds. This woman must have been voraciously hungry because that tumor had to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but that wasn't why the tumor was growing. The tumor's growth had nothing to do with her, was not caused by any changes in appetite or expenditure. It was caused by whatever was driving that tumor to grow. So this theory, this idea was based on a concept known as lipophilia, okay? It was a German-Austrian hypothesis pre-World War II. The leading investigators were Gustav von Bergmann, who was a leading expert in internal medicine in Germany pre-World War II. Today, the most prestigious prize of the German Society of Internal Medicine is the Gustav von Bergmann Medal. This man was no quack. And then Julius Bauer was a professor of endocrinology at genetics at the University of Vienna, one of the great universities of the world in the 1920s and 1930s, and I have a conflict of interest. My father graduated from the University of Vienna. Here's how Bauer described in 1929. He said, um, well, let me give you a little background before I read this. So uh, one of von Bergman's observations was based on a case at the late 19th century of a young girl who had a bad burn on the back of her hand, 
And the doctors took skin from her stomach, a graft from her stomach, and put it on the back of her hand. And then she grew up to be obese, and she had a huge tuft of fat on the back of one hand, but not on the other. So the observation was pretty simple. There was something about that tissue, that graft, that wanted to accumulate fat that the skin on the back of the hand normally doesn't. So he said there must be some characteristic of tissue itself that wants to accumulate fat, and they called it lipophilia, which means love of fat, and they equated it to hair growth. So they said just as we grow hair in some places, but not others, we get fat in some places, but not others, and we all know where those places are or aren't. And just as some people are hairier than others, some people are fatter than others, and there must be characteristics of the tissues, the hormones, the enzymes, the central nervous system that determine whether or not a particular body part, a tissue area, or a person is going to accumulate fat, and they call it lipophilia. So like a malignant tumor like the fetus, Bauer said, the uterus or the breast of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. Even in the case of undernutrition, wow, you could even, if with a theory like this, you could even begin to explain uh, the dual burden of obesity and malnutrition, because it suggests you don't need an excess of food to cause obesity. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. So you can think of this as a sort of obesity is a little bit akin to, to a tumor. The fat tissue is living for itself. Here's how Eric Graff put it. Graff was a director of the clinic at Würzburg. He was the author of a textbook called Metabolic Diseases and Its Treatment, which was such a, uh, a seminal textbook that Eugene Dubois in the US asked him to do an English translation, which this is quoting from. And Graff said, uh, described lipophilia as a condition of abnormally facilitated fat production and impeded fat destruction a sort of lipomatosis universalis in the sense that the lipophilia in certain tissues is primary and the sparing in the energy expended is secondary. It presupposes overnutrition, a good working hypothesis. By this means, if your fat tissue is accumulating fat or trapping fat in it and not letting it go, you'll have less energy to expend and you'll either be hungry or you'll expend less. So the growth of the fat, this trapping of calories of fat in the fat tissue is primary. The changes in intake and expenditure are secondary. Russell Wilder, who was a leading authority on diabetes at the, at the Mayo Clinic and became the first director of the Food and Nutrition Board of the U.S. government, 1938, he put it this way, he said, the effect after meals of withdrawing from the circulation even a little more fat than usual might well account both for the delayed sense of satiety and for the frequently abnormal taste for carbohydrate encountered in obese persons. A slight tendency in this direction would have a profound effect in the course of time. All the fat tissue would have to do is trap 20 calories a day, right? 20 calories a day of your food gets locked up for whatever reason in your fat tissue, you're going to become obese. The hypothesis deserves a ten of consideration, said Wilder. And then Hugo Roney wrote the first uh, monograph on obesity in the U.S., published in 1940. He was a, a Hungarian endocrinologist who was working at Northwestern University. He said the subsequent discovery that normal fat tissue was a site of considerable metabolic activity was looked upon by many as strongly supporting the theory which is now more or less fully accepted, chiefly in Germany by a number of the leading investigators. There was another version of this which was put forth by Wilhelm Falta. Falta was one of the pioneers of endocrinology in the world. He was the first person to establish that type 2 diabetics are insulin resistant. Harold Hemsworth in the UK often gets credit with second because Hemsworth was writing in English and Falta wasn't. Falta pointed out that a functionally intact pancreas is necessary for fattening. You know, type 1 diabetics, if, you, if they can't secrete insulin, they die emaciated. And he said, we can conceive that the origin of obesity may receive an impetus through a primarily strengthened function of the insular apparatus and that the assimilation of larger amounts of food goes on abnormally easily, and hence there does not occur the setting free of the reactions that a normal individual's work against an ingestion of food. 
Um, you can look at animal models to see if they support this idea of lipophilia. And the way to do it, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of interventions, uh, genetic, dietary, uh, surgical interventions you could use to make obese animals fat. And all you have to do is say, look, I do the intervention. For instance, I lesion the ventromedial hypothalamus of a rat, which was first done in the late 1930s, and the animal gets obese and tends to get hyperphagic, which means it eats voraciously. But what if I don't let it eat voraciously? What if I do the surgery and then calorie restrict the animal so it can't eat any more than a lean rat or what it was eating before the surgery? And what you find out is they get fat anyway. In virtually every animal experiment I've ever found, this is the case. And John Mayer was one of the leading nutritionists in the United States. He worked with the strain of fat mice in the 50s, and he said these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. They didn't get fat by overeating. They got fat if they ate at all. In fact, there are genetic uh, strains of obese rodents that you can starve them to death, and they will die with four times as much fat on their body as a lean rodent eating freely. So if obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation, the question is what regulates fat accumulation? And this is a, something uh, medical students learn in med school, but they're actually taught that it's not relevant to obesity, which is kind of weird, but we'll get into that. Very quick class, course, five minutes. I feel like this is going to blow up. Um, I'm going to go a little bit long anyway. Okay, so this is what you have to know. This is what the five-minute course on fat accumulation. Uh, fat comes in the human body. The, the kinds we care about are two forms. There's um, fatty acids, which are these long chains of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. And then they bond three of them with a glycerol molecule to uh, take the shape of this triglyceride, okay? Um, so fat is stored as triglycerides. I'll explain this briefly. And we uh, burn fatty acids for fuel, and we, we uh, ship... Uh, fat across the cell membranes, it's fatty acid. So here's the reason why, it's pretty cool. And this is what's interesting about this lipophilia hypothesis. What we care about is what makes a fat cell fat. That's the theory. The, the energy balance hypothesis cares about how much energy goes into the human body and comes out. It's like wondering why a restaurant in Manhattan is crowded and trying to figure out by counting the number of cars into and out of the city on tunnels and bridges. We want to know why that restaurant is crowded. We want to know why a fat cell accumulates excess fat. So here's where the energy balance comes in pretty handily. So what's cool about this, let me see if I can do this. Bingo. Um, fat fat, fat enters, uh, gets to the fat cells in uh, particles called lipoproteins, chylomicrons and low-density lipoproteins in the form of um, triglycerides these big guys, and then there are membranes on the fat cell, uh, enzymes on the fat cell membranes called lipoprotein lipase, which read at, reach out into the bloodstream and break those triglycerides into fatty acids, and then the fatty acids can actually flow through the, the fat cell membrane because they're small enough to do it, and then inside the fat cell membrane, the fatty acids are bonded to an activated glycerol molecule into this triglyceride. So the reason why we fix fat in the fat cells, why it's stored as triglycerides, is because the triglycerides are too big to get out of the fat cell. And the reason why we transport is fatty acids is because the fatty acids are small enough to get back and forth. And then the, there's enzymes in the fat cell called hormone-sensitive lipases, which break the triglycerides back down into fatty acids and glycerol, and then these can escape out of the cell. So you could think of this as whatever brings more fat into the cell works to make us fatter. So anything that brings more fatty acids through the fat cell membrane that bonds them as triglycerides works to make us fatter. And anything that works to break the triglycerides back down into fatty acids and get them out of the cell works to make us thinner. Okay, and what you want to know is what actually controls that. Remember, we want to know what actually regulates this uh, fat storage, because we got this problem of fat storage. So this was worked out in the late 1950s. Unfortunately, the German-Austrian school and the lipophilia idea evaporated with the Second World War. It literally vanishes. And the lingua franca of science actually changes. 
with the Second World War. Pre-World War II, the lingua franca of, of medicine was German and post-war was English. And the German references simply got dropped from the literature in large part because the physicians and nutritionists and researchers had fought in the war and had grown to hate the Germans and Austrians and wanted nothing to do with them. So this idea was left behind. But in the late 1950s, two inventions occurred. Uh, Three groups of researchers discovered mechanisms to measure fatty acids in the bloodstream. 1959-60, uh, Rosalind Yalow and Solomon Burson come up with this radio immunoassay that allows you to measure hormone levels accurately in the bloodstream for the first time ever. And they revolutionize the science of endocrinology. And Yalow ends up winning the Nobel Prize for this in 1977. Burson, unfortunately, had passed away by then. So you can ask this question now, what regulates um, the accumulation of fat and the fat tissue, and as Yalo and Burson said, it's the hormone insulin. And this, whoop, this diagram is from uh, a, a 2010 textbook by Keith Frain at the University of o Oxford University. And you could just see that when talking about fat storage, it's insulin, 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 insulin. And when you talk about fat mobilization, getting fat out, insulin suppresses, inhibits fat mobilization. These other hormones work to stimulate fat mobilization. But it was pretty clear even by the 1960s that insulin was running the show. And if you look at the suppression of fat mobilization, again, Yalow and Burson said release of fatty acids from fat cells requires only the negative stimulants of insulin deficiency. So if you pay attention to the actual regulation of fat uh, accumulation in fat cells and you ask the question, how do I get fat out of fat cells, the answer was lowering insulin levels. And you could see this, that insulin is a sort of fattening hormone in modern textbooks. This is from 2001. This photo was of a, a woman who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 17. For the next half century, she gave herself uh, shots of uh, insulin, the same two spots in her thighs, and she ends up with these enormous fat masses. And this photo is used in this textbook to describe the overall action of insulin on the fat cell, which is to stimulate fat storage and inhibit mobilization. You could argue that this woman did to her thighs what we've been doing to our guts and our butts for the past 50 years, and you want to know why. So here are the key points of fat cell regulation. When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. That's conventional wisdom, okay? That's textbook science. When insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots shrink. That's also textbook science. And then we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrates in our diet. Again, textbook science. There's nothing unconventional about any of that. And you end up with this idea as George Cahill, who was a Harvard uh, researcher who did a lot of this work in the 50s and 60s. As he put it to me, carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat, which again is conven conventional wisdom. The problem is, if you remove these three words, is driving insulin, and you end up with a sentence that's logically equivalent, carbohydrate is driving fat. Another way to put it is carbohydrates are fattening. And now you've got quackery. Okay, now you've got Atkins diet land. When I give this uh, talk to medical professionals, I often see this look on their face where they think, my, he seemed kind of thought-provoking and interesting, but suddenly he's in Atkins diet land. He must be a quack, right? But this is where the biology takes you. And you could see it in the textbooks. It's fascinating. Remember I said you taught this in med school, but you taught it's not relevant. Here's Leninger's Principles of Biochemistry, which is one of the most uh, seminal biochemistry textbooks. This is a 210 edition. And you can go to the index, and you can do this yourself. Go to your local medical school library, get this textbook, look up the word adipocyte in the index, and go to where it takes you, and you'll see this question, what makes fat cells fat or fat tissue fat? And it says high blood glucose, which you get from eating a carbohydrate-rich meal or being a type 2 diabetic, elicits a release of insulin, which speeds the uptake of glucose by tissues and favors the storage of fuels as glycogen, which is a storage form of carbohydrate, and triglycerols while inhibiting fatty acid mobilization and adipose tissue. So carbohydrates and insulin make fat cells fat, and then what makes people fat to a first approximation, obesity is a result of taking in more calories in the diet than are expended by the body's energy-consuming activities. This paradigm, this energy balance paradigm is so profound 
that you can find research in the world, and I've talked about this, who can give you a one hour or two week lecture on the effect of insulin on fat cells and fatty acid metabolism and how it increases storage. And then when you get around to ask them why people get fat, they'll say, because they eat too much. Okay, the alternative hypothesis, here it is. Like any growth defect, obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder. Okay, like any growth defect. If some aspect of your body starts growing out of control, it is a hormonal regulatory problem. Like type 2 diabetes, you know, obesity and type 2 diabetes are so closely related that some people consider them diabetes, two sides of the same coin. It is fundamentally a disorder of insulin signaling, and it's triggered by the carbohydrate content of the diet. Okay, not all carbs. You know, I say that and people start thinking, what about green broccoli? You tell me broccoli's fattening? Um, two types of carbs in particular you would expect to be uniquely fattening, okay? One are these high glycemic index carbohydrates, bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. These are the, um, they're uh, uh, digested and absorbed quickly. They raise blood sugar. The fact that it's the base of the food guide pyramid, which we started, um, promoting in the 1990s in the U.S. might begin to explain a little bit of the obesity epidemic. And then sweets up at the top, sugars, sucrose and high fructose corn syrup in particular are high fructose, they are high GI and high fructose. The so fructose is metabolized uh, almost exclusively in the liver and there's good evidence to suggest that that causes the condition caused insulin resistance, which would suggest that sugar is the primary cause of metabolic syndrome although unproven and it needs better tests. So here's a hypothesis, refined grains, starches, and sugars increase insulin secretion, lead to excess fat accumulation, obesity, and the obesity epidemic. You could ask the question, should this be surprising? What's fascinating is from the 1820s to the 1960s, the conventional wisdom was that these carbohydrates were uniquely fattening. This sentence was the first sentence in an article in the British Journal of Nutrition written by one of the two leading British dietitians in 1963. Every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. In fact, in the 1980s, when the British uh, government started pushing low-fat diets for heart disease, they had a sentence in one of their reports saying we have to get people to eat more carbohydrates, which will be difficult because we've been telling women they were fattening for the past 20 years. Back in the late 1940s, early 1950s, I found uh, five diets for obesity published by major medical schools in the medical literature. And these weren't rinky-dink schools. These included the Harvard Medical School, Cornell Medical School, Stanford Medical School, the best medical schools in the United States. They were identical to this diet published by Raymond Green in the Practice of Endocrinology, which was a seminal endocrinology textbook in the UK in the mid-20th century. Raymond Green was the most influential British endocrinologist. He was the brother of Graham Green. This is what the diet looked like. On the left, foods to be avoided. Bread, cereals, potatoes, sweets. Okay, that's the base of the food guide pyramid and sweets. And you can eat as much as you like of the following foods. Meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs dried or fresh, cheese and fruit except bananas and grapes. So one thing to point out is this is the Atkins diet in effect in 1951 written by, published by some of the leading researchers in the world, is the obvious thing to do with obese subjects. The other things that fascinate is they don't give you any calorie counts. They don't say you're allowed to eat 72 grams of this and 30 grams of that and try. They say you, can, you avoid the foods on the left because they're fattening. They have some characteristic that makes them put on fat. They didn't know what that characteristic was. They didn't understand insulin yet and its effect on fat metabolism. And you can eat as much as you like of them following, not because these people didn't get obese by eating too much. They got obese because they were intolerant of the foods that stimulated fat accumulation. Here's the catch, okay? And I'm going to go through this quickly. The problem is if you want to lower insulin and increase mobilization of fat tissue. It's what you call threshold effect, okay? So as you can see, as going down from the right to the left, you could see as insulin levels drop, fatty acid uh, turnover, oxidation and mobilization doesn't really change that much. And then it hits a threshold and it shoots up. And you have to be below that threshold. You want to be below that threshold. And the only way to know that you're below that threshold, that you're mobilizing and oxidizing your own fat, is to minimize your insulin levels. And the way you do that is by replacing the carbohydrates with fat. Because dietary fat is the one nutrient that does not stimulate insulin secretion. So if you do that, you're basically at the Atkins diet land. 
And this happened in a period in the 1960s when we started to believe incorrectly that dietary fat caused heart disease. So researchers naturally thought that if you told people to eat a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, you would kill them. Jean Maier, the nutritionist I mentioned earlier, was quoted in the New York Times saying that to, to recommend a low fat, uh, high-fat, low-carb diet to patients was the equivalent of mass murder. The American Medical Association took this on after Atkins published his book, and it was the best-selling uh, diet book in history, maybe the best-selling book in history. And this is what they said. They said, fat is mobilized when insulin secretion diminishes. OK. But low-carbohydrate diets that diminish insulin secretion are bizarre concepts in nutrition that should not be promoted to the public. The end result, you throw out the baby with the bathwater. The baby was people wanted to get rid of Atkins and the Atkins diet because they thought it would kill people and they didn't like him personally. They all knew him, the heads of the cardiology and obesity community. The baby was the regulation of fat metabolism and everything that determines whether or not we're storing fat or oxidizing fat and all the enzymes and hormones that control that. And as soon as you start thinking about obesity as energy balance, you stop caring about that. I have friends who have written entire books on obesity and never once mention the regulation of fat accumulation in the human body. It would be like writing an entire science book on cancer without ever mentioning a oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene. But that's what we did in the 1970s. So here are the conclusions. Obesity is sort of fat accumulation, not energy balance. Okay, that's sort of indisputable. One way or the other, obesity is a disorder of fat accumulation. Fat accumulation is regulated fundamentally by insulin and dietary carbohydrates. That's conventional wisdom. And if those two are true, then the solution to obesity and the obesity epidemics is not getting people to move more and eat less, but restricting the causative agent, i.e. the refined grains and sugars. Um, if that happens for the physicians in the audience, there still is this tendency to think that you're going to kill people. When I first tried this diet as an experiment, I was sure my heart was going to explode any day. And yet, since then, there have been... Uh, Dozens of clinical trials. This meta-analysis in 2002 went over 17 clinical investigations, 1,140 patients. So you feed people one of these low-carbohydrate, high-fat diets, and you get significant decreases in body weight, body mass index, abdominal circumference, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, triglycerides, plastic glucose, glycated hemoglobin, plasma insulin, plasma C-reactive protein, and high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. The good cholesterol goes up. Everything gets better when you remove the fattening carbohydrates and replace them with fat, including saturated fat. And then they say the effects on long-term health are unknown because surely this has got to kill people because it's so unconventional. Here's my last slide. I asked this question earlier. Why were those populations fat? This is how Richards put it in 73. He said, most third world countries have a high carb intake as their economic dependence is predominantly agricultural, with a heavy dependence on non-dairy produces. It's conceivable that the ready availability of starch and preference to animal protein contributing to must the main caloric requirements leads to increased lipogenesis and the development of obesity. By lipogenesis, it didn't mean it leads them to eat more or exercise less. It meant it leads them to form more fat. Anyway, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Tim.